फाइव फोर थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव नाउ सो वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू सो अगेन ऑन बी एफ ऑफ यंग सर्जन फोरम टीम with the moa ysf series i welcome you all for this episode being the brain child from dr vasudev gadigone to give the academic platform for young surgeons on this global platform we have started this young surgeon forums now this is almost 18th episode previously we do have a prestigious institutions from aims ganga hospital pune across india who have been our guest societies for that particular session today we are very fortunate to have uh, pune pimpri chinchwad orthopedic association as our guest society i welcome dr shailesh ratnaparkhi who is the president of pcoa and dr sham shinde who is the secretary of pcoa and dr nirmal who is the vice president of pcoa the main moderator for today's session will be dr hemant patil first of all i would like to ask dr vasudev gadigone sir to give a brief welcome address for everyone good evening everybody viewers of ortho tv and the all orthopedic members of the maharashtra orthopedic association i welcome you all on this auspicious occasion of the seminar of young surgeons forum maharashtra orthopedic association i welcome you all and now i hand over mic to dr sailesh ratnaparkhi Uh, to introduce their uh, pimpri chinchwad orthopedic surgeons who are taking part in this uh, scientific deliberation and to conduct further proceedings thank you very much <clears throat> hello yeah thank you dr gadigone for introducing the P- pimpri chinchwad orthopedic association this is a very new association which has come up in the last 2 2 and a half 3 years unfortunately two years were lost because of covid but uh, Uh, i think young surgeons forum we would be the most qualified people to uh, be part of this because uh, pimpri chinchwad is full of younger uh, team members so i think uh, me and say three or four of us are the only oldies in the whole uh, group all others are young and i think young uh, or uh, age aged i think young age is a number i think so most of us are young at heart even if by age we may be higher we may we are as young as the other people who are going to present today anyway we have five uh, people presenting today uh, one is a uh, dr kunal bansal who is going to present a case uh, which is very novel which is new which is different from uh, many cases uh, we have a couple who is working in derwan dr bharti devkar and her husband dr pankaj sharma we have dr pallav bhatia who is a spine surgeon and we have dr rajiv nirode a pediatric surgeon all of them will be presenting their cases and we are we are very happy to be given this chance and i thank dr gadegone and mc uh, team moi to have allowed us this group uh, himan can you take over yes thank you dr ratnaparki uh, at the outset i would like to thank team moi and uh, team ortho tv to provide us this wonderful platform so coming toward the speaker i would like to introduce dr kunal bansal he is a consultant joint replacement surgeon uh, practicing in the area of pune and pimpri chinchwad after completion of his post graduation study he has done multiple fellowships in india and in, at abroad today he is going to discuss a case of infected total femoral condyl total femur condylar prosthesis done for a giant cell tumor over to you kunal so yeah. share we also recognize the presence of today's two panelists dr prashant tonpe who is a moa executive and dr kiran savji sir वेलकम किरण साहुजी एंड प्रशांत टोनपे जी ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ महाराष्ट्र गुड इवनिंग टू एवरीबॉडी गुड इवनिंग थैंक यू सर शेयर स्क्रीन डॉक्टर कुणाल कैन यू स्टार्ट शेयरिंग योर स्क्रीन Kunal, please unmute yourself. I think there is some technical issue with Kunal's uh, network. Yeah, Mantha, you can switch over to next uh, presenter. Yes, sir. Uh, Bharti, madam, are you there? Yes, sir. I am here. Okay. So I will like to introduce our second speaker for the session because of some technical error. We will take Kunal's case uh, later on. 
professor dr bhakti uh, devkar sharma uh, she is working at uh, chipron valavalkar medical college and today she is going to discuss a case of closure of large wound it is a very novel technique which has been developed and studied extensively at their medical college and they are under uh, uh, the theory is under consideration for literature uh, publication so over to you bharti madam thank you So should I start? Yes, madam. You can pro proceed. Good evening, everyone. Today I am presenting a case series of large leg wounds treated by progressive closure to achieve delayed primary healing. Castello Anderson has classified the wounds into three types: that is, grade one less than one centimeter, grade two two to ten centimeters, and grade three more than ten centimeters. It is the grade two and three which we orthopedic surgeons usually find difficult to manage on our own. Right now, at present, the options that we have for grade two and grade three are development and primary closure, vacuum-assisted closure, split thickness skin grafting, and flaps like rotate local rotation flaps and free flaps. The advantages of primary closure of wound we all know that it gives a complete coverage to the underlying tissues, and thus there is less chances of infection, and it is definitely cosmetically superior when it comes to the scar. The disadvantages of vacuum assisted closure flaps split thickness skin graftings are there is it's a prolonged treatment multiple surgeries are required scarring to the site donor site morbidity and after doing all this the end result is usually cosmetically inferior well the challenges of performing these flaps and split thickness skin graftings or vac are we need a plastic surgeon for flap it is again always a issue about offer uh, affordability and accessibility in literature delayed primary closure has been achieved by various surgeons worldwide by different techniques like a shoelace technique release incisions using tensioner and using purse string sutures are few examples to quote in our study what we have done is we are using vertical mattress sutures using ethylon 20 which is available with every surgeon and these sutures are changed after every 2 days until we get the complete closure the inclusion criteria for our study is all the wounds that are greater than 2 cm on leg with or without fractures with or without skin loss we have kept the age limit as more than 12 years to be included in the inclusion criteria the exclusion criteria the vascular injury cases are not considered the age less than 12 years is not considered and patient who refused to consent for the procedure were not included i'd like to describe the procedure on day 1 we do debridement and if there is a associated fracture appropriate stabilization is done after that the wound over the wound stay mattress sutures are taken and then a dressing is done after this in the post operative in the post procedure protocol we give elevation over the bowler brown splint around 45 to 60 degrees iv antibiotics are given according to the hospital policy on after 48 hours when we open the wound what we usually find if you see in the picture one that i have shown that the given sutures look loose when this happens then under all aseptic precautions under local anesthesia using lignocaine and adrenaline we give in the intermittent mattress sutures between the existing sutures and achieve progressive closure after this the earlier loose sutures are removed dressing is done and the limb elevation is continued this technique is continued until complete step by step complete closure is achieved after complete closure is achieved around 14 days all the sutures are removed our results are we found gradual reduction of breadth and length of wounds in all our nine cases wound closure achieved was over 10 6 to 10 days from the initiation of the closure we did not have any infection all cases achieved complete closure and uneventful wound healing except one patient she was a 65 year old fame patient on long term oral steroids for asthma this is the case that i just showed you in which uh, within 3 Pro progressive suturing tech three sutures 
we got complete closure this is another case in which 14 year old boy had osteomyelitis of the tibia and we got to complete closure this is a case 3 in which 45 year old male had a large around 18 cm wound over the leg luckily he didn't have a fracture so it was a pure soft tissue injury in this also with in five sittings we got complete closure this is a case 4 in which there is a infected united tibia fracture with implant in c2 so a debridement and implant removal was done in the first sitting appropriate antibiotics were given vacuum assisted closure was used to make sure that the infection is completely taken care of and once everything had settled down we started with progressive closure and got complete closure of the wound this is a case 5 in which there was a dehiscence of cincinnati incision in a 48 year old female in whom in three settings we got complete closure discussion this technique is easy to perform and harnesses the viscoelastic properties of the skin to bring closure by biological and mechanical creep which can be done in a clean minor operating room or a clean ward dressing room with cosmetically superior wound closure our conclusion this technique is very easy to perform and needs no special equipment instruments suture material it can be performed by any doctor and does not require specialist surgeon delayed primary closure is achieved in 1 to 2 weeks the drawbacks are these patients need a longer hospital stay there is a delay in mobilization of 48 hours and it is definitely possible that a, so a patient might get infected the limitations of our of our current study are it's a very small sample size and there is no experience of this technique in upper limb cases we recommend that we should have a study with a larger sample size and look at outcomes in patients with different comorbidities thank you thank you for wonderful presentation bharti madam thank i have you. one query How did you decide that adequate tissue tensioning while uh, doing the closure? First stop sharing. First stop sharing. Then we can see discuss. Uh, yes. Yes, sir. <clears throat> yes, sir. Now go ahead. Go ahead. Sir, when we uh, apply sutures, what we usually do is we first take a surgical knot. After during that, if we need to use our assistant to keep give a step on it, that means uh, there is lot of tension over the skin. However. if there is not tremendous tension then after locking the first knot it usually does not give way so what we thought is if we are able to uh, put a suture and not you use the assistant's help for applying a stay or on the suture then it is giving appropriate tension and not excessive tension okay thank you thank you madam any, any more question? questions uh, yes sir yes, yes madam sir sir don't press sir please sir so but it is it was very uh, nice presentation and nice study so i wanted to ask you about the how which uh, suture material you are using while well, because of the tension you you should use at least uh, 10 or 20 like that okay. so which yes, sir. uh sir ethylon uh, yes sir we have used ethylon in all our cases and because we have performed all the uh, cases were of the legs that we uh, got a chance to uh, treat we have used 20 ethylon in all the cases for the child who was 14 years old we have used 30 ethylon 30 which material which material sir ethylon okay. yes sir. madam one question i want okay. to ask. yes sir sir you are mute gaade gone sir you are mute sir i can't hear sir ha no no i want to ask how much tension you give to the suture because uh sometime it is possible that in the friable tissue you may get a cut through effect phenomena in that case it is a very difficult on the contrary you may propagate the wound whatever existing it is there and there may be a vascular compromise between the two sutures so Sorry. in that case what is the tension you apply and when you stop that uh, compression over the wound by sutures sir uh, like i said so it's a very uh, valid point and that was the fear we always had and so we always took it in a step wise manner and never were in a hurry to achieve closure though after giving lot of tension sometimes we feel yes we can get the uh, closure however what we had decided as we will give only tension to a limit where i do not need a assistant to hold the knot first suture knot after application to maintain the Uh, approximation that i had achieved after applying the suture 
so when we take a surgical knot and we lock the suture then we should not need assistant to uh, put a uh, step on it to uh, control the tension to uh, control the release of the suture So I think yes, all please. your cases. Oh, yeah, Saudi sir, please. And then one comment. See, if you use PRP along with this, we would it help healing. Sir, better. I will definitely uh, keep it in mind. This is my suggestion. Cases, yeah. I'll do it. Yes, sir. See, see, whatever wounds you have shown, they are the like you have tried to cover whole wounds with muscle first. There is a complete uh, things which will be enclosed. But what happens if the bone is exposed or there is a depth in the cavity? Sir, Where uh, the real challenge occurs, sir. Would you recommend the same technique? Uh, uh, sir, uh, my cases. Could I share my screen again to show the cases? Two cases wherein there was a completely bone deep wound. In one, there was no skin loss. There was fall of a wall, and so the patient had developed a uh, swelling and a break in the skin. And in another, he had infected implant in which, after debridement, there was skin loss. In both, the bone was exposed. In both the cases. so in that case the difficulty that we encountered is after applying a suture and maintaining the average tension there was gap in between and so the entire tension was over the skin edges so we found two uh, methods to reduce the tension in such cases what we did was in the first case earlier we used a very diluted betadin solution gauze pieces and they were interposed in that uh, wound so that when the suture was tightened the majority that gauze piece also shared that uh, tension and the skin which was uh, between the sutures was not the only part which was having the tension in the second afterwards after doing this case in the second case what we have done is we are using dynaplast long strips and we hold the skin in approximation and we apply dynaplast after the dressings primary dressing so that helps the entire skin to be pulled towards the wound and so not the the tension is relatively reduced is what was our experience okay certainly a very innovative technique would be very useful practically and i think everybody able to do i think this thing yes sir easy you, and replicable yeah. fair amount of good results uh, you can uh, just comment on you can use uh, like abdomen we can use that uh, Oh, uh, that uh, I in one ring tube or yes, like sir. that I, to pre prevent the cut through of the skin. Sir, I went through that uh, while uh, going through the literature, and that was the plan. But unfortunately, I have not got that big wound later in the recent time to uh, try it out. Prashan, Prashan, they did it two ways forward. Actually, sometime if you use that uh, uh, small rubber or something like that, through that uh, you pass the needle. Yeah, it make produce a strangulating effect on the existing. Uh, it, it has to be not a tight. It is just for preventing cut through, not cut for through. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. It is preventing cut through only. Yeah. Hello. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bharti, uh, madam, for your nice presentation. We'll move on to our next speaker, uh, Kunal. Uh, can you share your screen? Yes. Just a second. till the time i'll introduce kunal he is a consultant orthopedic and joint replacement surgeon practicing in pune and pimpri chinchwad area after completion of his post graduation he has done multiple fellowships in india as well as abroad uh, today is going to speak about total femur replacement in case of giant cell tumor over to you kunal yes thank you for the kind introduction uh, dr hemant uh, is my screen uh, visible you yes. need to have a full screen you are not full screen yeah okay yeah you need the full screen Is it full screen now, sir? No, no. Just a second, sir. Yeah, just click on that. I think you restart the screen sharing again. I think last time you had done it. Just yeah. a second. Just a second. Sir. Open it first completely, and then share that window. This is the advantages of Yang Surgeon Forum. That how difficulty you are getting and we are solving it. So, <laughs> true, true, very true, very true. <laughs> Still, it's coming as uh, screen. It is. Uh, it is in PPT mode. It's not in slideshow. Is that fine, sir? You you just run that. You, you start. You start. Screen. I think you start. Try to you run start. it as. 
So we can we can see this well. So okay. yeah, go ahead. You can start. Let's not waste time. Okay, sir. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank the Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, Pimpri Chinchur Orthopedic Association, for this opportunity. So today I'm presenting a case of infected total femur condylar prosthesis, which was done for the giant cell tumor of the distal femur. So just to give you a brief about the patient, the patient was a 76-year-old male who presented to a center in Nashik with complaints of discharging sinus and severe pain in the right thigh and knee region. He had history of being operated on the right lower limb for giant cell tumor of the distal femur one year back. And he was operated once again after six months for infection post-thorn injury in the same lower limb, six months post the index surgery, for which a debridement and irrigation was done at a center in Pune. Patient presented to the current center. You are not, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. You are not. Uh, slide should move ahead. Slide, the slide needs to go ahead. Slides, slides are not moving. Just, a Just click on the other next slide as you talk. Yeah, yeah. Resume, it, it, you can resume the slide. So if that is working. It's not, it's okay now, sir? No, no, no we are not. You can click, click on the left side on the screen and uh, go ahead with the next slide. Come on to the left side. Click on the next side manually. No, go to the high. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, now it's moving. You have to go yeah, back. Yeah, this yeah, way, this way right. you can start. That's right. That's right. So, what is ha so what's yeah. happening is as soon as I'm making it full screen, it's getting paused automatically. Oh, no, okay. You can go ahead, go no ahead with this. Yeah. Continue okay. with this split screen. Okay. So, uh, sorry for that interruption. So, uh, patient presented to the current center with history of inability to bear weight, swelling, and intermittent fever. He was a known case of diabetes on treatment. So, this is the uh, clinical picture and the x ray picture. Uh, any comments, any uh, observations from uh, uh, colleagues? We can see loosening of can the you processes. you please mention or hello, Kunal? Yes, yes, sir. Can, can you please uh, demarcate where the previous yes, incision was on the thigh? Yes, sir. So uh, on the right side, you can see the image of the thigh. You can see a, a, a paracentral incision being taken on the anterior aspect of the thigh. And you can see an evidence of a sinus on the anterior medial aspect of the thigh. So on the left, you have the radiological pictures in which we can see the upper third of the femur with the implant in situ with evidence of osteomyelitis and loosening. And we can see the distal megaprosthesis in situ with the tibial implant and the hinge. So we got an ultrasound and Doppler of the patient done, which showed a massive uh, sized abscess approximately 25 into 10 into 10 centimeters on the anteromedial aspect and the anterior aspect of the thigh. So I'll go back to the previous slide again. So how would we approach this patient? Yeah, we got. Uh, do you have any relevant blood markers for this? Ability? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the patient's uh, general markers were uh, borderline elevated. His ESR was approximately 60 millimeters. His CRP was approximately 40. This is how many um, uh, years after surgery? So, so this was first year after the primary surgery and six months after the secondary surgery in which a debridement, uh, implant retention and uh, irrigation was done. So there is some persistent infection ongoing. Yes, sir. And also instability where you can see that uh, uh, this is a uh, sharp yeah. side. Yeah, so it's a yeah. the cement and that stem interface. There is certainly loosening which is happening. Yes, sir. Dr. Prashant, do you have anything to comment? Don't pay, sir. No, <clears throat> there is a. Uh, is there the sinus was connecting? You, you have you taken a sinogram? No, sir. We didn't do a sinogram because it was a gross abscess and it was pouring. And in the oh. ultrasound, a gross communication to the deeper tissues was completely found. So we were pretty convinced that it was a deep seated infection. Okay. Okay, you can move it. Next. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, these were the options uh, which were offered. Should we go for a debridement uh, and an implant retention again? Should we go for a debridement and an explant? Should we go for a spacer and external fixator? Or should we go for an amputation? So this is what we did, sir. We did a thorough investigation, including routine blood mark markers, ESR and CRP to have a baseline value. Uh, fortunately, the patient was not on any antibiotics for the uh, past four weeks. So we did an aspiration of the pus pocket under all aseptic precautions and sent it for extended cultures with aerobic and anaerobic organisms as well. So the culprit organism was found to be methicillin resistant staph aureus, 
which was sensitive to vancomycin. We did a detailed discussion with relatives uh, in which we spoke to the relatives about a salvage versus an amputation versus a restorative prosthesis. So these are the interoperative pictures. The first picture on the left, the moment we took an incision onto the thigh, we can see that there was a massive pool of pus which is accumulated in the inter anterior and lateral compartment of the thigh. The second image on the right shows the implant in situ with evidence of the biofilm. The third image shows the situation after the explant and the fourth image shows after extraction of the tibia. So we went ahead and debrided the entire anteromedial and posterior pockets. After we were satisfied with the debrima, we went in for a creation of a spacer with 80 grams of, uh, of uh, cement mixed with 4 grams of vancomycin. And also we went in for stimulant 15 grams uh, mixed with 2 grams of vancomycin. The, all these antibiotic selections were in consultation with the infectious diseases specialist. This was the post-operative x-ray showing the uh, canal with the cement envelope in situ with uh, debris of stimulant seen over the intermedial and lateral compartments of the thigh. Six quadrant samples were taken interop, which showed the organism to be uh, MRSA sensitive to vancomycin, which confirmed our preoperative organism. Postoperatively, vancomycin was continued for a period of four weeks. Patient was put on rifampicin for 12 weeks postop. Unfortunately, the patient came back to us after six weeks with history of fall from the bed. X-rays were done, which showed evidence of a fractured spacer. The image on the left shows evidence of breakage of the nail over, over the proximal third of the spacer. We again posted the patient for surgery. We prepared for revision of the spacer versus the definitive procedure as investigation still displayed a borderline elevation of markers and effusion. We went in and were not convinced about the condition of the soft tissues. So we debrided again and revised the spacer. We again waited for a period of eight weeks with antibiotics, high protein diet, good uh, BSL control and optimization. Patient came for follow-up after about 10 weeks after the second debrima with normal blood work and optimized general condition. We again counseled the patient for an amputation versus a definitive surgery in the form of mega prosthesis uh, of the total femur. The patient at this stage was still not agreeable for an amputation. So we went in for the mega prosthesis. So this, these are the interoperative pictures of the definitive surgery. The first image shows after the excision of the remnant of the femur, we can see that almost uh, entire upper third of the femur was osteomyelitic and necrotic, almost extending up to the lesser trochanter. So we excise the entire fragment. We again did a formal debrima. In, on the image on the right, we can see the extent of the debrima done and the nature of the tissues post debrima. We went in for implantation of the tibial component with cement mixed with vancomycin. These are the lateral pictures of the incision and debrima. That is the trial prosthesis in C2 after measuring the length of the expected implant. That is a lateral picture of the trial component in C2 with reduction of the head at the acetabular side and the locked mechanism of the distal femur into the tibial base plate. This is a picture of the assembly of the component. So we went in for a bipolar uh, component on the top and for a hinged component at the bottom. So this is after reduction of the knee and the proximal femur visible. This is a picture after reduction of the implant. We can see that the head is well seated the distal femur is locked into the hinge at the base plate of the tibia. This is an image after the soft tissues have been begun to be closed and repair of the abductors to the proximal eye holes of the uh, proximal femoral component. These are the post-operative radiograms in which the entire implant is visible. That is the acetylene socket all the way down till the tibia hinge and the tibial base plate. Hemant, you're muted. Well, do you have a video to play? Yes, I'm just playing it. Just be quick. Yeah. We're exceeding our time. Yeah. Is it visible, sir? You are visible. Just a second, sir. The screen is stopped. 
just a second so this is a picture of the patient yeah walking first day a second day post operative he is walking unassisted unassist, uh, with the help of a walker the drain is in c2 and there is no evidence of any neurovascular deficit So I think so I'll stop yes. the screen, uh, share, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Kunal, for such an elaborate case discussion on this not so usual case. I have one query. Yes. Uh, right now you mentioned about the abductor reattachment to the prosthesis. Yes. Yes. So is there any technique wherein we can use the native bone to the prosthesis and again we can improve the abductor function? Yes. So basically, in uh, in cases which are not septic. we usually prefer to leave a collar or a cuff of bone attached to the abductors and then attach it to the uh, prosthesis to be honest it doesn't make much of a difference because anyways that part is going to resolve because it has no bony contact but your point taken it's always better to have a preserved bone stock attached to the prosthesis but in this case we had to explant the entire femur because there was evidence of necrotic patches all the way till the uh, greater to end of the femur and we didn't want to leave behind any infected material Professor, guiding only sir. Okay. Do you have any problem? Okay. okay. Any? Yes, how many days after right now after the this, uh, last surgery? So the patient is currently four months uh, post-op, sir. He's walking. Yes, yes, with he's walking. Support. Sir. Yes, sir. Okay. There is uh, no what, any infection. No, sir. So what we have done is, sir, we have put him on suppressive antibiotics, uh, and we have also kept him on rifampicin to prevent late organism growth, and we've kept him on this for at least at least three months currently, sir. another 3 months dr kunal yes sir nice presentation thank you sir uh, i th i think rifampicin should be um, accompanied with one more uh, antibiotic because it 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 will give uh, resistance very early yes sir so we have put him on another antibiotic as well sir so they he was hello which antibiotic yes. so we have so, so we have put him on septran sir So yeah, he was sensitive. He was on yes. septran, and we didn't want to yeah. over boost him with antibiotics. So we kept him on the lowest possible oral antibiotic to which the organism was sensitive in the reports. So we kept him on septran with rifampicin, sir. Okay. Uh, points, sir. Good points, sir. A very Kunal. It's yes, a sir. Very heroic surgery. Thank you, sir. But there is only one point to explain to the patient: how far there are chances of not reinfection in that particular case because you are exposing. the patient to a very uh, heroic surgery and uh, you have to guarantee something to the patient right sir so how you convince the patient that you will not get infection again right, or uh, after the surgery because uh, microorganism they keep on coming and then there is the reinfection delayed or the post surgery there are so many issues yes sir so uh, you have to give a full explanation to the patient before i think uh, one should uh, start sir yes sir so so what when we spoke to this patient at every stage we did discuss with him the incidence of infection we told him that there is as per literature and as per our experience there is almost a 70 to 80% chance that you might have some persistent infection or this infection may come back but even spite of being 76 year old the patient was so determined that he said i would rather lose my life rather than lose my leg so at every point of uh, at every point of surgery we did counsel him that you might get reinfection and if you do get reinfection that there is there is going to be a very difficult path ahead because after we excise the femur there is nothing we can do except for disarticulation but then the patient was so determined and since his markers were coming into uh, levels we decided to go ahead with a guarded consent and with a video uh, confirmation and uh, uh, consent even the longevity for this uh, prosthesis we need to explain yes sir yeah. absolutely sir so we explained him that also sir that in this situation we can expect a maximum longevity of about 5 to 7 years considering that it is infected considering that it's a mega prosthesis it has its own uh, uh, pair of issues but again as i said the patient was very determined <clears throat> patient said i would rather lose my life than lose my limb so in spite of all this we did plan to go ahead sir yeah, yeah. wonderful question thank you sir there to find such a enthusiasm in uh, in this age group in 70s yes, absolutely uh, absolutely heroic surgeon i would say a heroic patient to have 
wonderful you, presentation thank you, thank you sir thank you sir yeah. uh, so we'll switch on to next speaker dr pankaj sharma you can start sharing your screen i'll introduce dr pankaj uh, kunal you can stop sharing your screen uh, i have stopped okay thank you yes pankaj dr pankaj sharma is a postgraduate uh, orthopedic surgeon with special interest in arthroplasty and arthroscopy currently he is working in department of orthopedics at walavalkar medical college at chipron and today he is going to present us a modified technique of tension band wiring in fractures of lateral and clavicle dr pankaj you can take over am i audible yes, yes sir, clearly audible screen is your screen is visible well. yeah yes thank you good evening everybody uh, many thanks to maharashtra orthopedic association and pimpri chinchwad orthopedic association for giving me this opportunity to present our modification of the traditional tension band wiring for management of that length of clavicle now um sorry is it visible i'm not able to see yeah please go ahead hey go ahead uh, go ahead i'm so sorry for some reason the slides are not moving let me just शिंदे सर नमस्ते नमस्ते सर नमस्ते माय प्रेजेंटेशन इज अबाउट द लेटर एंड क्लेविकल फैक्चर्स एज वी ऑल नो lateral and clavicle fractures particularly the knee type second a and b they are inherently unstable and operative fixation has been suggested however there are so many methods of the fixation that there is no particular consensus regarding what kind of fixation is the best and we still have so many techniques now uh, if i may ask from the panel uh, among the techniques uh, shown on the next slide Which which is your preferred technique? What do you prefer? Do you prefer the plates, the K wires with TBW, or the arthroscopic or uh, reconstruction or substitution of the ligaments, CC ligaments? What do you feel, mm -hmm. uh, sir? Reconstruction of uh, ligament is important. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Same thing. Arthroscopic endobutton and reconstruction of coracoclavicular ligament. That technique I will use. Right. Right. And people who are not doing arthroscopy, what would you prefer? Anybody from the panel? Costa, Costa wires with tension band wiring. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, now, in spite of all these techniques, the reason why we still have the plates is because uh, AO recommends the plating, either the hook plate or the lateral and clavicle plates. While still, the the we just heard that there is a group of surgeons who would prefer reconstruction of the CC ligaments. Now, the the reason being that there are complications and problems with each method, particularly the hook plate. it necessitates the removal of implant with regards to the lateral and clavicle plate which is what is ao is currently recommending it's a stable fixation but again it needs a large exposure lots of muscle stripping it's a prominent hardware and again implant removal needs another surgery k wires or k wires plus tbw it is more flexible kind of fixation it needs less exposure compared to plating but then because it's not that stable it needs protection in the post operative period there could be problems with the ss wire now with regards to removal of implant this can be done with a smaller incision but again uh, there there are complications the last thing as uh, dr tun pay and uh, sir sauli sir suggested reconstruction of the coracoclavicular ligament now it could be either using the grafts or uh, the recent devices like lockdown or surgical lock sutures but we are still talking about this procedure because uh no particular procedure is can be considered the best and uh, a removal a surgery for removal of implant is needed so my technique what we uh, are presenting is we modified the kvy with tbw uh, and substituted the ethy bond along with muslin tape instead of the ss wire this is not a new technique some of the other authors have presented it earlier so what we do is uh, in supine position with bolster under the clavicle 
uh, and the approach to the lateral end. We are doing open reduction and fixing temporarily with two K wires. Uh, following that, what we are doing is after exposing, going a bit medial on the fragment, about 2.5 centimeters from the fracture end, we are making an anterior posterior tunnel. We, we have tried using multiple drills and we have come down to four millimeter drill beads uh, for the west size using a uh, number five ethy bond uh, loop, which contains two strands along with one muslin tape, which is a 5mm woven tape. We are passing it through the tunnel. And as you can see in the image, we are passing it over the lateral end of clavicle in a figure of weight fashion and getting it under the K wires along with some fibers of the deltoid and tying it over. Now, this is replicating the tension band wiring and using the sutures instead of SS wire. For re enforcement, now we have seen in our experience that Ethibon does give a good amount of compression. Muslin tape has been used along with it so that the fixation is reinforced. Now, these are our cases. The first case is a 35 years old gentleman. He had fall from bike and the fracture had oh. the yeah. type two knees fracture. Bolo you can bolo. see the, the post-op image. You can see the tunnel which we made to pass the sutures over it. And this is the, this is the post-op pretty x-ray after six months. It has healed nicely. The second case, he was another 28 years old gentleman, history of party, and you can see the fixation. Now, our post-operative protocol was arm sling was given for about three weeks time and the pendulum exercises were started. We avoided overhead activities until six to eight weeks until the K wires were removed, but we didn't find any problem with the shoulder function after removal of, even after starting after six weeks. Now, uh, these are some of the images of the first case which I showed. You can see the surgical scar there, which has healed nicely. And he's got almost full shoulder function comparable to the other side. Uh, usually with regards to shoulder immobilization and starting the shoulder rehab after six weeks, most people would suggest that overhead abduction and rotations might be something which could be restricted, but we didn't find that thing uh, in our cases. And it's almost equal to the other side. Okay, so we did about three patients using this technique and all of them healed in about 12 to 14 weeks, which is similar to, similar to the other literature as described. And they had full shoulder function at the end of six months. Now, the main benefit of this technique is the cost. We are avoiding the, the cost for the implant or for a prolonged surgery. This is a surgery which is being, has been done traditionally and we are just substituting the SS wire. This surgery preserves the acromioclavicular joint, which might have been, which might be sacrificed when we are doing hook play. Last thing, other than uh, the re reduced cost of the implant, the implant removal for removal of the K wire could, can be done under local anesthesia in OPD, just by taking a small stab incision. So resurgery is avoided. Limitations. Now, of course, we have a uh, limited experience with only three patients so far using this technique. And so far, we didn't have any complications, including the complications of Kiva. We didn't have any of the, any of the loosening or migration, either medially or laterally. Uh, these are my references. Thank you and uh, open for questions. Yes. Uh, Dr. Pankaj, uh, it's a nice presentation. Yes, the study uh, number of cases is pretty low. Yes, we want to know whether uh, uh, you uh, you put the wires, K wires go out of the uh, clavicle on the medial side or you keep it buried within the marrow cavity? Uh, so we do keep, we bend the K wires and we bury no, them. No, I'm talking about the, the medial end. Medial end. Medial end, sir, it's, it's buried in. So, so we do get the hold of the other cortex but then they don't have to be so far that it would cause any kind of uh, any kind of sharp penetration superiorly. So yeah, we do get the bicortical hole. Just penetrate the other cortex. Yes, sir. 
Yes, sir. I have one question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you passed the fiber tape and ethibond through the medial end of clavicle. Was there yeah. any specific instrument you used to drill through it? No. So uh, initially we did try because for the idea to pass the sutures, we did try using 3.2 drill beads. And finally, we came down to 4 mm drill beads. And in our experience, uh, it was really smooth passing. Now, the muslin tape, it, it wasn't fiber tape, it was the muslin tape. So the woven muslin tape is about 5 millimeters. And two strands of ethiband, ethibond using a small mosquito, we could do it without any particular instrumentation. And that was the basic idea that we wanted to use the instruments which we have available locally. Uh, of it's course, really in some other cases, they can use fiber tape or orthofiber. That would be better in my, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah. Dr. Pankaj. Yes, sir. Do you think 2M, 4mm drill bit is too large for a, a bone size that may uh, give away and uh, get fracture there? Yes, sir. So, sir, uh, well, in our experience, what we thought it was that initially we did try using the smaller ones. But even, even the literature, there's a good article about the anthropometric measurements of lateral clavicle in general of orthopedics. It suggests there's it, the, the distance, the supero inferior width of the clavicle, supero inferior thickness of the clavicle is about 10 to 14 millimeters in uh, different demographic people. So 4 mm should be good enough. Of course, if in, in a particular patient, we find that it's very thin, then what I would suggest is using a smaller drill bit and then passing a bigger drill bit over it so that the drilling is done in a concentric fashion and uh, the, there's no risk for the breaking of cortex on either side, superior or inferior. And uh, it has to stay at least like 2.5 <clears throat> centimeters away from the fracture side so that the tension doesn't cause any, any, uh, any, pass, any breakage of the bone there, bone bridge there. While tightening, you keep the limb in which position? Pardon? While tightening the figure of it. Yes, sir. You keep the shoulder in which position? Sir, so we, we do we do support the clavicle uh, as it as it is suggested. So uh, I, I would say the shoulder a bit abducted uh, is definitely good. Uh, the main idea was that because we, we are doing the tightening uh, visually under vision, we can see the fracture side. So uh, even, even using our fingers, uh, you would see that there is complete compression and uh, no particular, I didn't see any particular position for the shoulder, but definitely supporting the shoulder would help. Okay. What is Just the age group one, of your patients, Dr. Pankaj? Age group, age group of your patients. Uh, so so uh, all of these were young middle-aged uh, gentlemen. So the youngest was about 24 years and the oldest was around 44. Just Pankaj, one more uh, suggestion that you can yes, secure yes. your fixation with adding one more the remaining muscle tape loop to the clavicle and coracoid process so that reconstruction of the ligament is also done. So that will be a very good fixation. Uh, it will it won't come off even if it is a wendy non union or like that. Yeah. So that is the idea yeah. of uh, ligament reconstruction, CC ligament. Yes, sir. yes, sir. taking That's... an additional loop to, uh, over the core the the yeah, yeah, absolutely. That is yes. a very good uh, fixation. Then it will be... and the instability is in that direction mainly. Yes, so sir. to neutralize yeah. those forces. Yeah, <clears throat> and then one more uh, the, uh, you can tie the knot on the end of button because what they have seen the, the tying the knot directly the on the bone, yes, yeah, it, it has to be on the bone with uh, some end of button or something on which uh, to take good hold of. The, yes. uh, yeah, that is another another addition you can do. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, right. So it's a good suggestion. Uh, just that from my side, I didn't have any experience passing doing that. But yeah, in future cases, I'll keep that in mind. It's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. It's a wonderful technique. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Nice presentation. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Pankaj. Yeah. It was very nice and crisp presentation. We'll move on to our next speaker, Dr. Pallav. Dr. Pallav, you can start sharing your screen. Yes. In that time, I'll introduce Dr. Pallav. He is a spine surgeon. He is postgraduate in orthopedics and he has done a fellowship in Indian Spinal Sur Spine Surgery Center at New Delhi and also fellowships in uh, USA and Germany. Right now, he is practicing in Pune and Pimpri Chinsword area. Today, he is going to discuss a case of atlantoaxial instability in a rheumatoid patient. Over to you, Dr. Pallav. 
Thank you, sir. <clears throat> so, uh, hopefully, my screen is visible. Yes, your screen is visible <clears throat> and you are audible. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so, this is a case of uh, uh, of a female patient who is uh, 66 years old, and uh, uh, she presented to me in the OPD with uh, uh, upper neck pain, occipital headache since one year, and numbness over both the hands on and off, difficulty in walking and standing and giddiness. And she used to uh, use a crouch for walking. So, uh, and she is a known case of rheumatoid arthritis. She was on medications uh, since very long time and she is hypertensive also. So I would just like to ask you that how many, uh, so we routinely see rheumatoid arthritic patients in our OPD. So how many of these patients uh, also have uh, pain uh, of uh, complaints of neck pain? So uh, do you encounter such patients in the OPD? Not also neck pain we offer uh, get, but uh, not occipital headache. Not so common. Not so common. Okay. So uh, generally in uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, the uh, neck pain and involvement of the cervical spine is very common. And uh, uh, this patient was conscious, alert, normal muscle bulk, uh, muscle bulk, and she was having local tenderness at the upper cervical vertebral level. Her range of movement of cervical spine was painful and restricted in all directions and her Hoffman sign was positive on both the sides. So uh, on examination, shoulder examination was normal. Her tone was normal, sensory was normal. Power grade was almost uh, four by five in bilateral upper limb and lower limbs. And her reflexes were exaggerated in both upper limb and lower limb. So uh, this is her, uh, her X-ray. So uh, uh, I have, so uh, this X-ray uh, shows bacillary invagination, which I've uh, just drawn with three lines by which we can uh, see that the bacillar invagination is there. Uh, the black color line uh, is the macri line. Uh, the red color line is the macrigal uh, uh, line. And uh, the blue color line is the Chamberlain's line. So, and this shows, this is a flexion extension x-ray, which shows uh, atlantoaxial instability. And this is our MRI. So in MRI, we can see that the, her dense is totally uh, resolved and her ar arch of atlas is also not uh, visible. That is also resolved. And there is com severe compression at the, uh, at the atlantoaxial junction. And that uh, the posterior part of the odontoid is, uh, is compressing her spinal cord. And also we can see myelomalacia over there. So, and this is our uh, T1 image where, where we can see the posterior part of the uh, C2 body, which is compressing the spinal cord. These are our axial images. And this is our CT scan. So uh, in this view, we can see that there is, uh, so there is a uh, resorption, total resorption of the dense. And uh, we can see the atlanto axial interval, the distance that is increased. And also here I have, I have drawn the lines which shows that there is bacillary invagination also. So ultimately, uh, she is a case of uh, atlanto instability with bacillary invasion with compression of the, uh, of the cord at the C1-C2 junction. So uh, I would like, uh, I would just uh, want to know that how do we proceed further in this case? Uh, like who would like to manage it conservatively or who would like to treat it surgically? I don't think uh, conservative management will have much role because she is sitting on a volcano. If you, yes, don't, if you don't fix it. Yes, sir. So uh, this uh, atlanto axial instability is diagnosed because uh, in flexion, if we see that uh, the atlanto axial interval is 9 mm and in extension, is this, it is 5.5 mm. So it is increasing in flexion. So that suggests that it is atlanto axial instability. So when we come to the management options, so there are a lot of management options uh, which are available in the literature and which have been changed from time to time. So uh, one is, uh, so initially what was practiced was uh, wiring techniques. So there were wi uh, wiring techniques which hold it from C1 to uh, C1 uh, lamina to C2 lamina and they used to do arthrodesis by putting a bone graft in between uh, the two. So there were uh, Gill's wiring and Brooks wiring techniques and then uh, came the uh, the era of transarticular screw fixation, and then 
After that, uh, it was introduced posterior C1, C2 screw uh, rod construct. So in which we put the C1 screw and uh, C1 uh, LR screw, C2 uh, pedicle screws, and uh, we fused it with the bone graft. But in this case, uh, what we did was uh, we, uh, we, we put the C1 uh, lateral mass screws, we put the C2 pedicle screws, and we supplemented, uh, we uh, augmented the anterior fixation with a cage and with the bone graft because uh, her anterior support was lacking. So that's why we put put in this cage so that uh, she gets the anterior support. So uh, and also uh, we did her DEXA scan, which showed severe osteoporosis in her case. So it was uh, it uh, it was it was needed to give her additional fixation. So that's why we put this bone graft. So if we come to the uh, discussion part, we in rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic progressive systemic disease of connective tissue which involves the synovial joints. It is more common in females and presents in four to five digits. So in, uh, it involves the spine and mainly the cervical spine is involved in 25 to 90% of RA patients. So clinically, it presents as neck pain, occipital headache. It is due to impingement of the posterior MI of lesser and greater occipital nerves. And there can be neurological symptoms, uh, which is often uh, myelopathic symptoms, which can lead to even sometimes quadriparesis or quadriplegia also. So if a patient comes with rheumatoid arthritis B and if she complains of cervical spine, we should always uh, uh, get an, we generally go for a X-ray of cervical spine, but we should also focus on occipital cervical junction because a lot of times we uh, uh, like tend to focus on more of uh, the cervical spine. So uh, this is the message I, uh, we, I want to give it from this case. Thank you. Okay. Uh... Dr. Pallav? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, do you, did you not see, feel the need to involve the occiput in your uh, arthrodesis or fixation? Because if you see, if you can go back to your uh, see, uh, MRI. Yeah, this yes, one. Sir. This one. Yes, the sir. compression is between the uh, the occiput and the uh, whatever. C1 is not visible. So, do you not think that there will need to involve the uh, occiput in your fixation? Sir, uh, first of all, the compression was mainly because of bacillar invagination, because of atlantoaxial instability. Because of the instability, she was get, getting this myelopathy and uh, uh, the myelomalacia. So, uh, and also if we include occiput, there are a lot of chances of occipital plate failure, which uh, an occipital plate failure is there. A lot of time wound complications are there. So it is mostly done when we don't get good hold at C1 screws either, or we don't fuse anteriorly, or we, uh, so at that times we go, we go to the occipital junk, occiput. Uh, generally, we tend to avoid occiput in most cases of atlantoaxial instability if we get a good hold at, uh, in the C1 lateral mass screws. Yeah, Pallav, yes, how often do you see a rheumatoid patient with this type of atypical presentation? Is it quite common in your practice or is it something very not uh, the sort of rare thing to have? Uh, no. So uh, this is this is rare. Uh, this is rare in the sense that this, this patient had myelopathic symptoms with gait disturbance. Uh, generally, we see neck pain, occipital headache. These type of patients we generally see. But uh, with the myelopathy, with uh, patient presenting with myelopathy is obviously, it is rare. Any other questions? More questions? Well, you can stop sharing, I think. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pallav, for a nice yes, presentation. Sir. Thank you, sir. Hemant? Yes. Pallav, sir, you can stop your uh, presentation. Yes, you can sir. stop sharing your screen. It was very nice presentation. Thanks for that. And uh, in this webinar, we have touched trauma. Hello. We have done arthroplasty. We have done spine. So one of the major portion ah, of orthopedic ah, training ah. is pediatrics. So I introduce oh, Dr. Oh, Rajiv oh, Pirone. Oh, oh. sir. I introduce Dr. Rajiv Nirone. Dr. Nirone, you can start sharing your screen. Yeah, I was ready. Yes. Uh, he'll be talking on unusual presentation of radial neck fractures. Over to you, Rajiv. Dr. Rajiv. Yeah. Thank you, Hemant. Uh, let's go ahead with my uh, case presentation. 
So this was a seven-year-old girl who had a fall from bicycle and sustained injury to her left elbow and presented with this uh, X-ray. We can't see. We can't see your uh, presentation. 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 Okay. Start your presentation. I think we are only able to see your desktop screen. Okay. I'll again. I can do that. Just a second. Nirone is a leading pediatric orthopedic surgeon in Pimpri Jinsh or Bosri and Pune area. He is taking care of all the emergency pediatric needs of our orthopedic colleagues. And he has his uh, uh, keen interest in academics as well. He is a regular uh, case presenter in our uh, monthly academic sessions. Yeah. Are you set, Rajiv sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just I'm doing that. Just a bit. Yeah. Can you see now? No, it's not, not yet started. Not opening. Yeah. Just a second. Are you able to see now? No. No. We are seeing only desktop images. Achha, only desktop. Okay. Yeah. Just. What do you stop? See. Stop sharing your screen. Open. Yeah, that I'll, I'll again first. do that. I'll again do okay, that. Open that presentation first. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll again do that, sir. Not a open problem. Open that presentation and select that window. Yeah, yeah. Open the desktop. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah. it's visible now. Yeah. yeah. But it is not in presentation mode. Yes, done. now it's in presentation. Mode. Yeah. So uh, this was a seven-year-old girl who had a fall from bicycle and presented with injury to the left elbow, pain, swelling, and difficulty in movements. And uh, this is the kind of X-ray. Uh, classically, the pediatric radial neck fractures have been classified by Judet's classification into these uh, four variants, where the uh, first one is a, a undisplaced or a horizontal shift and the severe most is there is a complete displacement with more than 80 degrees uh, displacement and uh, almost no contact. Uh, the radial head usually gets displaced in lateral aspect, but sometimes you get different types of presentations like in this case the radial head can go anteriorly. Uh, or posteriorly, this particular injury is described by, as uh, Jeffrey's type and classically seen in uh, cases with uh, elbow dislocation, where while the time of relocation, the radial head gets entrapped and stays behind the capitulum. Or there can be another incidence wherein the radial head stays in place and the shaft gets displaced medially and hinges uh, along the uh, coronoid. But in this case, surprisingly, both the shaft as well as the fragment was lying medially. So just a quick question to the panel uh, panelists. Uh, how, how will you tackle it further? Will you investigate it uh, or are you okay with this particular x-ray? Oh, I would like to see the CT scan. Uh, what additional information, uh, Prashant sir, uh, you want to see? The fragmentation and because of the yeah uh, valid point. Lipipice, valid point. Lipipice. Whether you want to see whether the head is split further uh, into a couple of pieces or something. Yeah. Right. Point taken, sir. Point taken. So I had not done CT scan uh, uh, when this injury uh, was pre presented. It it was in an area where uh, there was no CT facility immediately available. So. Uh, this is an intraoperative CM picture where you can see the radial head uh, lying over here. Um, just a quick question again. Uh, will it be possible for it to get it closed? Uh, Raju, do you have an arthrogram, intraoperative arthrogram? Uh, not required because here it's very uh, uh, clearly visible. Uh, the radial head is quite, uh, you know, um, uh, the anatomy Mature. is very clearly visible. So I had not done. So anyways, um, we, have to, we have to try close first. Yeah. So close, right. yeah, close. I tried. Uh, in fact, I uh, tried to even get that fragment out with a percutaneous uh, mosquito forceps, but it was not uh, successful. Uh, so I decided to do the open reduction by the standard Cocker's approach. So what you can see over here is this particular um, 
part is the radial uh, shaft but the radial head was not visible over here so then i had to take another incision anteromedially and expose the radial head uh, i was a little uh, uh, skeptical whether i i need to take this radial head out and put it back or whether it has any soft tissue attachments but children are breast with the gift of periosteum which during fractures uh it gives a very nice uh, you know coverage to the uh, fragment so this particular fragment had a intact periosteum and the head was surviving on that particular uh, <clears throat> soft tissue attachment so i retrieved it from the uh, uh, another uh, i mean anteromedial incision i pushed it back into the radio capitular area and uh, i reduced it and fixed it with a wire this is a k wire whose tip has been intentionally cut to make it further sharp and beveled at one particular end rather than a pointed tip and a subchondral purchase was taken the fixation was done and this is the intraoperative video showing a good reasonable stability allowing full pronosupination so i immobilized the child for about 3 weeks in a plaster and took one x ray at 3 weeks but what had happened was the this is a immediate post op x ray where you can see the uh, alignment uh, uh, very nicely done and the pin which is holding at the subchondral area at 3 weeks the pin had penetrated might be there was some collapse or uh, or the pin may have some loose hold and may have advanced so probably the advancement had happened so i decided to take this patient again under anesthesia and i withdrew the wire and i checked for union so this is a intra op live image of c arm which is showing that both the fragments are moving together so i decided to take out the nail and intra op she had full pronosupination as well as flexion and extension so post operatively then she was started with active range of motion exercises within sorry within her uh, pain tolerance limits so at 6 weeks follow up she had good uh, alignment the radial head was still uniting at 6 weeks and she had fair uh, pronosupination <coughs> movements at 6 weeks terminal flexion was restricted about this is at 6 weeks now at 6 months she has full elbow extension elbow flexion supination a terminal restriction of pronation a good carrying angle the radial head is still uniting as appears on this x ray so this child will be kept under observation for uh, further um, uh, uh, progression of the uh, valgus and this child i'll need to keep at least for uh, follow up for about 5 years or so so when i uh, reviewed the literature so a case has been presented uh, uh, reported in the uh, indian journal of orthopedics wherein uh, dr murli podwal has presented this so this was a 12 year old male who had presented with a fall and this radial head had was lying on the medial side the shaft was there the radial head had fractured and lying medially so what they had done was they had retrieved it from another anteromedial incision and secured it with a t plate and ended up with uh, a functional range of movement from 30 to 110 and 40 degrees of pronosupination on either side so this case is a little unusual in presentation where both the shaft as well as the radial head had displaced medially surprisingly with a good soft tissue attachment still kept so i could able to i could get it back in its anatomical position and fix it so i this child will be under observation and maybe i'll be able to present it after a good decent follow up of at least couple of years yeah thank you so much thank you dr rajiv for your elaborate presentation <clears throat> uh what is the maximum length of k wire that uh, you have i have 9 inches k wires 
Okay, and is it readily and easily available? Do I have uh, kept them tailor made ready? Uh, okay. In my they set, are they are available. Customized. Yeah. Can you can you stop sharing, Doctor Rajiv? Yeah. So yeah, I'll I'll stop, sir. Yeah. Instead of putting a single long K wire, is it advisable to have two wires to have two point of fixation instead of single? So that yeah, in yeah. chance that, of that, the penetration of physis can be avoided. Yeah, the the idea of put avoiding two K, I mean putting two K wires, I did not uh, wanted because uh, the soft tissue attachments. I just wanted to not get disturbed further, even by putting those wires we are from lateral to medial aspect. So that's why I preferred a intramedullary implant. <laughs> So maybe the wire, if I would have used the little thicker wire, the implant, the wire may not have any penetrated. So that's in retrospect. Now I feel that I should have done that. Can we, How can you explain the things? rotational movements uh, in with a single wire? I mean, I'm really surprised to see that you were get able to get pronosupination on table where both the fragments were moving together with a single that, wire. It, the subchondral hold was that nice that it, it, it could give me that kind of uh, movement. So that's why I was a little, uh, you know, confident that this has a stable fixation. But if we do end up with surprises that it did penetrate it. But ultimately, the uh, it's my as a routine protocol at third week, the X-ray was taken before mobilization. And uh, this point was picked up and uh, we had uh, examined under anesthesia to make sure that both the fragments are moving. So I can then start mobilization as early as possible. I think the additional stability is because of the culture of joint, the convexity and con yeah. concavity yeah. yeah. that has given a good hold additionally. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Can we use tense nail in this case? We can, sir. We can use tense nail. As I said, where this I had done in a setup where um, the city of facility was not there, tense was not there. So I used the customized K wire. Tense nail can be used. Nice presentation. Anybody any other questions? Amongst the panelists, does anyone have any question? No, oh, it's nice presentation. Actually, I <clears throat> the two K wire uh, from the middle of the shaft near to the uh, from the, near the tuberosity you can put. I think what what will be uh, your view as a pediatric orthopedic surgeon? I don't know. We we <laughs> we can put sir as I said that I just did not wanted to do. A, add any further insult to the soft tissues. That's why I avoided putting anything extra osseous. Okay. That can, was the can, only can, reason. Can you just enumerate that technique of putting that k wire because you have done it very beautifully. So how is the starting point? How do you mold but, that wire and uh, how do you introduce to get an accurate reduction? Uh, basically, uh, the, the reduction was open reduction done. So when, when I put, what I did was I retrieved the head then I took the entry and passed the typical tense nail entry what, what we take, uh, just contoured the nail a bit so that it negotiates the cortex. And when it went till the fracture, it was reduced and just pushed manually to get enough hold in the subchondral bone. And once that was done, then intraoperatively the stability was assessed and the, the nail was cut in that position. So that's why the nail tip was a little, you know, at risk. It was a little proud. Maybe that had prompted it to pierce. This is all in hind, uh, you know, uh, uh, in retrospection. Yeah, 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 I can say that. Yeah. I think it's a very beautifully done and it's a wonderful surgery. Yeah, yeah. So, Hemant, yeah. Uh, any uh, more questions we have? Yes, from... uh, that's all for today's academic fest. And we are done with all the presentation and all the question answers from all the speakers. Uh, this concludes our academic part. And I would like to thank MOA, Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, President Dr. Gadegonu sir, to provide Pimpreach Institute Orthopedic Association this opportunity to showcase our talent. This was a <clears throat> wonderful academic fest, which we all enjoyed. Along with Dr. Gadegonu sir, I'd like to thank Dr. Manoj for providing his valuable support and all the on time, uh, what I would say is constant uh, updates regarding the seminar. I would like to take this opportunity and thank team Ortho TV, Ashok sir and uh, Neeraj sir to provide such a wonderful platform. Apart from this, 
very uh, our very own pimpley chinchu orthopedic association team including dr ratna parki dr dirmal dumne dr sham shinde and everyone of us who took all the efforts including speakers and special mention of dr tonpe who made a pivotal role for uh, uh, pcoa to get recognized with mo and bringing us this opportunity at our doorstep i thank one and all Dr. kindly uh, excuse Dr. me if i have mentioned uh, i if i am mentioned anybody's name Sauji. dr sauji's name sorry uh, that's my bad i didn't mention dr sauji's name thank you all uh, i would hand over the mic to dr ratna parki who is our president and he will give a uh, vote of thanks yeah i think a vote of thanks has already been given by him and we just wanted to uh, uh, acknowledge the the uh, honor bestowed upon us by maharashtra orthopedic association by giving us this evening so thank you so much dr gadegone dr pavukar and dr sauji and dr tonpe for being with us uh, all my speakers who have done a wonderful job and i'm i'm very happy in the sense that we had a trial run about 4 days ago we made a lot of mistakes but i i see, see that all of them have been corrected uh, almost uh, completely so i'm very happy with my team and uh, i want to thank everybody for that thank you so much thank you i must yeah i must thank all of you because it was, they were all crisp presentation well within time and we do a mix back kind of all the spine pediatric trauma joint so everything was included so it was certainly a very enriching experience in all the fields for all of us so i must thank PCOS uh, Orthopedic Association for all their efforts, uh, especially uh, the President Dr. Ratnamarke, uh, Dr. Shinde, Dr. Heman Patil. I think who had taken lot of efforts in ascending all those uh, cases, and uh, Dr. Tonpe and uh, Dr. Kiran Sauji. So I uh, thank you again all for uh, sharing your uh, experiences and uh, your time for this today's webinar of uh, MOA YSF. So thank you again. Okay. Good night to you. Okay. Good night. Thank Good night. you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. I think yeah. I think now we we can do we can exit all of us. Yeah. Thank you.